Well, thank you for tuning in tonight to the Lessons of Vietnam show. Uh, we're very excited tonight. We have a, a guest, Lieutenant Mike Cook, who is in infantry, 11 Bravo. Uh, that's 11 bullet stoppers for some people. And Mike, appreciate you being with us tonight. And uh, we're going to do our uh, normal introduction of the slide there. There you go. Uh, we try to tell the story of the Vietnam War and the men and women who uh we're involved with it. We try to dispel the mistruths and the downright lies that are out there. A lot of misinformation uh, about uh, the Vietnam War and those of us who fought it, and we try to get rid of that. I'm your host, Bill Dixon. I was Vietnam of 67, 68. I was there for the Tet Offensive of 68. We're broadcast uh, from the uh, studios of Nissan Communications, the international studios here. Uh, if you would like to uh, be participate in the show, uh, just dial 919-518-9773, or even better, go into your computer to Computers 2K Voice on Skype. That is Computers 2K Voice, which you can see it there on your screen. Uh, and then you can ask Mike questions, or you can call him up and tell him he's full of you-know-what and uh, whatever you'd like to do. It's uh, your opportunity. Uh as you, we've talked before, there's uh, about 22 vets a day commit suicide, and we want to uh, make this information available so that if you know a veteran who needs help or if you are a veteran who needs help, uh, this is the way to get it. And uh, now we're going to see Mike in his um, uh, infantry outfit there with his uh, pistol and uh, his uniform. Uh, that's Mike, and uh, let's see, Mike, you were there. That picture, you were at uh, Dion? No, that's after I transferred to the 25th. Oh, uh, 20, I noticed the patch was different. Okay. Division. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, listen, before we get really going into your slides a little bit, uh, tell us, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in northeastern North Carolina, a little town called Rich Square, about 100 miles from here, close to the Virginia uh, border. And... Uh, Farm farming was the big thing back then. I was born in World War II, and uh, oh man, I wanted to be in the army so bad. And uh, played with surplus, uh, had army surplus store even in that little small town, and I had one of everything. And I just look forward to the day when I'd be able to get all that stuff free. And I did one day. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you were uh, always anticipating and in, in, in joining the army. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I didn't exactly join the drug me in there when it got down to it because oh, Vietnam yeah. was, you know, not not something everybody got real enthused over. But uh, yeah, I like that. I like the army life and 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 like the idea of being a soldier and like the idea of loving America, a small town. We all thought that was our duty to do what America called us to do. You know. So. How long after high school did you get drafted? Oh Lord, I kept. Uh, they didn't have a lottery, and I finally got drafted April the 18th, 1968. And uh, as long as you were in school, some kind of school, they wouldn't get you. So I stayed in school. I went to every school in North Carolina almost. Uh, like I say, <laughs> that war, that, uh, it just uh, wasn't one. I, I, I was hoping to wait and, and go to the next one where they weren't shooting real bullets. But yeah. anyway, they, when I finally uh, got out of college, the man says I'm looking the wrong way. But anyway, uh, uh, got out of college. Uh, they waited for me patiently and uh, they drafted me uh, pretty quickly after I uh, got out of college. And on April 18th, 1968 uh, was a day I'll never forget. Because a lot of people, a lot of men got a college education just just to keep from uh, <laughs> going over to, over to Vietnam. So you uh you did finish school. Uh, oh, they, yes. they kicked me out. I, I actually they actually thought I was supposed to go to classes and <laughs> and do work and so forth. So they kicked me out. So well, I finished um, several schools. Yes, sir. I don't mind telling you. I was now, <laughs> where, uh, did you go? You went into when they drafted you. Where did you go? To basic training. Fort Bragg. Uh, Took us down to Fort Bragg and had a big scare, actually. Uh, of course, it's kind of depressing. You know, you know uh, the Vietnam War, uh, about half the people were protesting against it, and it was uh, uh, you just didn't know what to expect. And uh, 
and just wasn't something you get real happy over, like uh, World War II, uh, you're going off to save America, you know. But uh, anyway, got the call, and I went, and I got to the uh, old CPNL building downtown, uh, was the induction center back then, mm-hmm. and got there for the last stop before they put us on the bus to send us to Fort Bragg for basic training. And uh, the guy in charge, the sergeant in charge, came in there and said, okay, boys, I got good news and bad news. He said, we were four Marines short this month, yep. and we need four of y'all to step forward. And it got real quiet in that room, and didn't nobody move a muscle. And finally, they went around and picked four great big boys and uh, made Marines out of them. But uh, I, I really wasn't too enthused about being a Marine. Well, I Mike, just... I went through the same induction center, <laughs> and the guy came in and only needed three Marines. <laughs> Thank goodness, because I was the next one. <laughs> But, uh, so you went to Fort Bragg. What time of year was it? It was uh, April, so it's springtime. Springtime, uh, okay. probably a pretty good time to to go. And yeah. uh, and Fort Bragg was. Uh, I went with uh, three or four buddies uh, from from around the area, around Rich Square, where I was from. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we stayed buddies all through uh, actually advanced infantry training uh, down at Fort Polk later, but. Uh, we 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 uh it made it more tolerable and uh and Lord got down there and heard about how uh the terrible marine drill sergeants well uh it was different because we had the sweetest drill sergeant that you ever saw and he was he was just a nice friendly guy and uh and we got some good training they ran about thirty pounds off of me doing basic training and uh and hey I've been used to uh hunting and shooting uh, uh all my life and uh. Being out on my daddy's farm and, uh, you know, Boy Scouts camping out. So, hey, it was kind of life. I, I kind of halfway liked that part of it. I just didn't really want to go to Vietnam and and, and get uh, get that other part of it. By but, the way, uh, what y'all, what y'all farm? You farm tobacco? Yes, farm tobacco. We got uh, still own it. Uh, uh, me and my daughter and wife still own the farm down on the Roanoke River there in uh, Northampton County. And... Uh, Farmed uh, tobacco back then, sold our tobacco allotment uh, years ago. It got so specialized, yeah. but uh, mostly corn there and uh, and soybeans. And I uh, used to a lot of cotton. My dad was a cotton gentleman, and he ginned cotton and then farmed on the side. And then uh, when the cotton got big, uh, the cotton ginning got uh, got busy, uh, he would uh, uh, farm on uh, arrangements with uh, farmers that would do it for him, and they would share the profits or whatever. Yeah. work up some kind of deal but uh we'd go down uh to the farm during the 1950s after school every day uh doing hunting season had two wonderful point pointer hunting dogs and i had a great big brain and automatic shotgun big and i well I'm, if you can't tell here but i'm a little bit of guy i was five seven uh, when i went in the army and now i'm about five five uh been shrinking up a little bit but uh my spine's decompressing or whatever, but uh, hey, that was the kind of life I loved. So I, I, I loved a part of it, and with my bu- uh, buddies from uh, around the area, uh, we had a pretty good time and uh, ate good, loved the army food, and uh, they maybe lose a lot of weight for all the exercise, though, but I needed that, and uh, hey, I was pretty happy. Well, how did you get to OCS? <laughs> well, uh, after basic training, they assign you to a branch, and uh, although I was kind of used to the infantry type of life, you know, being a Boy Scout and and, and shooting and hunting and everything, camping out and, and everything, like in the outdoors, uh, the infantry was uh, not the most desirable occupation in Vietnam. So, uh, but uh, at the end of basic training, they assigned everybody a branch, and then you would go on to advanced training in that branch so branch, I was, by branch you're talking about artillery infantry arti- right uh, supply mm-hmm. whatever okay. right mm-hmm. okay. so i was uh i was assigned to infantry and was going to fort, fort polk louisiana for advanced infantry training which most everybody in the in the company uh same situation because they need a lot of infantrymen in uh, vietnam but uh my parents came down, and they were proud of me, you know, heck, and uh, I was proud of, of making it uh, through in good shape uh, 
through basic training, but I, <laughs> it's, it's funny the things you do remember. My parents, uh, they told me later, else I'd have been mortified if they'd done it, but I had a, a captain, was the company commander. He was the infantry captain and a good, good leader. And uh, they went to him when they found out at graduation, basic, basic training graduation, found out that I was assigned to infantry and said, uh, Captain, uh, there's been a terrible mistake made. Our boys are college graduate several times over, and he's just as smart as he can be and, uh, and uh, knows a lot of accounting and all kind of good stuff like that. And they put him in the infantry, and uh, he was smarter than they were. Though. He said, Mr. and Ms. Cook, uh, what would happen if we put all the dummies in infantry and, and didn't throw a, a few smart ones like your son in there to kind of help keep things straight? We'd have a big mess, wouldn't we? And they said, oh, okay, I, I, I see your point. So They probably had that conversation before <laughs> with some other, with other parents. <laughs> I imagine. And, uh, I mean, peacetime, oh, Lord, I'd been tickled to death. But, uh, yeah, hey, it still wasn't the end of the world. And, uh Everybody knew we were going to Vietnam, yeah. so we went on down near Fort Polk, Louisiana, and uh, that was kind of a miserable place, a lot of mosquitoes and everything. And uh, well, you had to get you prepared for Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I thought I thought maybe since I had uh, worked in tobacco and used to the heat and humidity, that when I got to Vietnam, mm -hmm. I wouldn't notice a difference. But uh, mm -hmm. there is a big difference. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, you get used to it. You, you know. It, it, a human can get used to a lot of things, mentally and physically. So, uh, you know, that was doable. But, uh, yeah, Fort Polk was... Uh, well, that, you went through amateur training there at uh, AIT. Yeah. Uh, they mm -hmm. had Fort Polk. And then mm -hmm. where did you go to uh, officer candidate school? Well, they, they kept me in the infantry. Uh, I kind of uh, replay of the original story, but uh, kept me in the infantry then and said, uh, okay, you're going to stay in the infantry your whole Army career, it looks like... Uh, uh, private cook, and uh, I said, uh huh. Well, uh, what else? What other options would I have? Maybe. And uh, and uh, by the way, I won the trophy for being the best marksman in the whole uh, advanced uh, training company, and I've still got that sitting out on my shelf. Hey, hey, I'm proud of this stuff. You know, yeah. it was right down my line of uh, of life. And uh, but <laughs> I'd rather been in another branch than infantry in Vietnam. So. Uh, they said, well, we, we're thinking about it. We'll send you the Armored Personnel Carrier Driver School. And I said, oh, hell, that's it. we're going from bad to worse here now, boys. Can't we do something else? They said, well, if you volunteer for Infantry OCS Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, we're kind of short on infantry lieutenants right now. Matter of fact, real short. Uh, Did you think about why they were short? <laughs> 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 Not really, you know, hell, it was somebody else, but uh, maybe luck would change for me. But anyway, I said, you know, rather than being on a personnel carrier driver, I believe, because they always throw the little uh, caveat, I mean, the little uh, sweet hand on the deal, said, hey, they need out of the company of, uh, of uh, trainees when you finish OCS, it is infantry OCS, but they'll usually assign two or three guys to something else so you know, something will pop up like uh you know quartermaster corps or mp or something like radio that operator. yeah and uh <laughs> that's what you want and so you just radio, you might. That big tall antenna people can <laughs> yeah. see you better oh i'll take remind me to tell you a story yeah. about that in cambodia that antenna is a nice target but anyway uh so i i, I said okay what the heck uh, so i signed up for infantry ocs at fort ben in georgia and uh Oh, Lord God, that was hell. That was much worse than any of the training or Vietnam. They were mean, 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 mean. Had good food, but you get to eat about two or three bites of it, and um, they throw you out. I mean, they just slam me. I guess they wanted to toughen us up a lot. But uh, anyway, it was good training. And uh, I really, uh, we had a few drop out. Uh, but uh, they knew that would make the trip to Vietnam a lot quicker, so I guess that, that helped keep some of them in. But uh, I I would kind of probably have liked to drop out myself, but uh, I said, I'm a damn thing going to run me out of here. You know, it ain't doing anything they want to, but I'm going to make it. So, uh, well, I made... How long from the time you graduated from OCS, Officer Candidate School, 
to you arrived in Vietnam? Oh, Lord, heck, I don't know. I can't count that. But anyway, uh, well, that's six station, months. You stationed stateside for a while? Yeah, about you six months, so CS. Oh, okay. And then I went back to Fort Bragg, which, hey, I was liking Fort Bragg. <clears throat> that was kind of close to home, about uh, 70 miles from uh, my little hometown of Rich Square, and uh, which I'd lived all my life in the same house. And uh, so... That, uh, that's where you got that Southern Virginia accent from. Then. Yep. Got that uh, kind of English tidewater accent, still haven't lost it. And, uh, and people, a lot of people still recognize it. But uh, so uh, what was I talking about? Uh, you were talking <laughs> about OCS and went back to Fort Bragg. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm getting kind of old, boy, as you can tell. But uh, so my memory lapses on, on uh, recent things. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, went through OCS and went to Fort Bragg and they signed me. There was basic training still going on at Fort Bragg now. It, it stopped. Uh, probably done. I don't know if it stopped while Vietnam was still going, but uh, it had been activated at Fort Bragg, uh, basic training had. Yeah, and so when they, I went through in 66, uh, it was at Fort Bragg. Oh, was it? Okay. So they sent me down there to a training company as a training officer and had a, a captain as the company commander. And uh, then we saw more about that shortage uh, that we'd been suspecting on uh, officers. Uh, they sent him off to Vietnam, and they want nobody else but a brand-new second lieutenant to take over the company. So, Lord have mercy. And those drill sergeants were good, but uh, a lot of them were prima donnas and, uh, you know, a, a second lieutenant that don't know a damn thing about the real life in the Army is uh cannon fodder for them so uh but i made it through that and uh and uh oh lord i probably stayed there well until october 69 you can count that up but anyway uh probably six months at fort bragg in the training company and now did you fly over or did you go by boat you fly flew over and i got a little break uh they said, we're going to send this whole infantry class infantry uh, class of infantry second lieutenants to Fort Sherman Canal Zone for uh, jungle expert training. Hmm. And uh, I said, oh, man, that sounds cool. I'd seen some of the guys wearing these. I, hey, I'd collected all my patches. I wore my uh, jacket here and made scrunch up and try to show you some of the stuff on it. But I'd always loved all my patches and stuff like that. I collected them. Got my daddy to get them from the guys who came home from World War II and Korean War and saved them and just loved them, you know. And uh, and that jungle expert patch, you weren't really supposed to wear it unless you were cadre on your pocket. But I thought that was cool. And you could get a certificate that said, you're a jungle expert with that pretty patch on it. And, uh, hey, I said, I'm going a, I'm to a bear it. I'm going to get me one of them. So uh, probably only 20% of the guys got them because the uh, whole class of infantry second lieutenants knowing they were headed for vietnam they didn't really give a happy damn about you know uh, being a jungle expert or nothing they uh they'd go into town and uh get drunk you know uh when they let them go and i sat up there hey it was neat i'd sit up there on, on fort sherman the canal was down in in view and i sit up there on the uh high slope and uh doing my time off rather than go and get drunk at the bars and uh, watch the ships come through. So, <laughs> hey, I find things to enjoy. And, uh, well, look, Mike, let me ask you this question. When you got to Vietnam and you had that certificate saying you were a trained expert jungle guy, <laughs> how impressed were the sergeants? Oh, I didn't even tell nobody over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would have that would, that would been kind of hokey. But uh, uh, I got a uniform. I, I put it on. I bought a couple of patches in Panama, and they're handmade, and uh, and they're probably pretty uh, collectible now. But uh, I've I've put it on some of my uniforms that I wear later. And this like this jungle jacket I'm wearing now is uh is uh, uh about '69 dated. It's a genuine Vietnam issue jungle jacket. Uh, but just like the one in the picture. I've got it fixed up. Well, now when I was with the 25th Division later. I wasn't going out in the field uh, leading the platoon. So, uh, but when I was first there leading the platoon, they would dump the, the uh, uniforms out on the ground, and you just go pick one up, and it, it'd last a week, and then you throw it away. Didn't have no insignia on it. Didn't really want uh, 
lieutenant's bars and, and that kind of stuff on them. Or uh, we've gone to subdued name tags rather than the bright yellow, white. And, uh, yeah, when the I yellow. first got there, we had the old uniforms with the white name tags mm -hmm. so they could see you better. They had back done away with that by 69. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, so where did you have when you got when you finally got to Vietnam? Where did where did your orders bring you into? Would you come in through ninth replacement at Benmar Air yep, Base? Yep, sure did. Okay. And uh, I remember the trip over on the plane. Went over on the plane. Uh, at Company A, uh, which I was assigned to, Company A, First Battalion, Eighteenth Infantry, First Infantry Division. Uh, went over by boat in 65, and, and we have a company organization where we have reunions from time to time, and uh, and those guys uh, went over by slow boat. And, uh, hey, which I wouldn't have minded to make the, make the uh, <laughs> trip uh, yeah, your time longer. Started and your when time, the boat left. time started when the boat left. And, hey, that was the thing about that jungle school. Time started when I left uh, my hometown, I think, uh, and went through Charleston and flew down to Fort Sherman, and that was a two-week jungle school, I believe. And, hey, I was tickled for that time to be counting. So I, October the 3rd is, is what my d -rose was. That's date of expected return from overseas. And had one year sentence to Vietnam. The war lasted one year for us Army guys. Well, the, um, you got the ninth replacement, and then you got assigned to... Uh, uh, First Infantry. First Infantry. They, I remember they filling out some of the paperwork. They said uh, uh, it had one of the forms. It said, uh, what are your choices? Where do you want to go? And, of course, I wanted to go number one choice was Saigon and uh, do something in Saigon. And this, when you got to the real choices, they wouldn't just laugh at. I, I had a friend uh, that had been in the First Infantry Division. He was a... a Lieutenant went over there as a second lieutenant in the infantry, just like me, and uh, was a rifle platoon leader over there and got wounded and had his time cut short. And he said, you're getting the big red one, man. And uh, so I, I, my first real choice that would count it, I chose that. Hey, if, if you choose something that they need, the Army will put you there. So they put me there, and I was kind of happy because we didn't get, have to go up too far north. Uh, I'd heard bad stories about getting up too high. North. So where where were you located when you were there? About thirty miles above Saigon, the oh, rear okay. the rear base uh, Zion. Not too far from Coochie. Yep, yep. And and yep. the uh, Parrot's Beak. Yep, yep. Okay. Sure was. So it well it was pretty good terrain if you had to choose some terrain and uh, well it was out of the swamp and it was out of the mountains. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, and it wasn't. Uh, I don't think I ever saw NVA. We were we were messing with BC, and uh, they were not as uh, apt to be in big groups and as well equipped and everything as the NVA. So hey, I was kind of happy to stay down uh, as far south as I could. For you uh, non-Vietnam vets, the uh, uh, the NVA was the North Vietnamese Army, who were well trained, uh, had uniforms and just about everything that we had. And of course, the VC were the Vietnam uh, Vietnam Communists, which were the uh, guys wearing the black pajamas and so forth. And as, by the time you got there, they had the good weapons too. Mm -hmm. uh, they mm -hmm. started out with the old makeshift, but by the time you got there, they had the real weapons. Let's go into your slides a little bit here that you brought, and tell us what you got here and uh, who the who the pictures are and so forth. Okay, this may not be in any particular order, but uh, anyway, this is not rehearsed as you people can probably tell. So. Uh, here it comes, and uh, hey, let me go on and 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 right. give you a disclaimer right okay. now. The, what, the, the things I'm gonna tell you is gonna all be true. I ain't gonna bullshit you on uh, making up no uh, wild war stories. I'm damn proud about having been in the infantry, and I'm damn gone proud about. Uh, I don't know if you can see this combat. CIB? CIB here, and I see other guys wearing that thing. I like them. Right. And uh, for those I, people out there, what does it take to get a CIB? Being infantry or special forces or airborne and be in combat, period. That's the only right. way. In other words, you don't get that by just showing up. No, no, no. You got to be boots on the ground, shot at, and shoot back. Right, and I'm proud of that thing, and everybody I know that's got one is proud of it. On uh, Veterans Day and, and things, uh, special occasions, uh, I wear a pin. I got little ones. I pin on my uh, lapel and, and wear to church or anywhere I don't care where I'm at. I'm proud of having been 
And when I was over in Vietnam, I, I, we called them guys that weren't in the infantry back in the rear ramps. And that was a real bad name, uh, rear echelon MFs. Mothers, yeah. And, uh, but, hey, if they'd have said, well, would you like to be one and try to straighten them out? Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, I'm sure we would have. Uh, hey, us, us back there in the back, we got shot at and, and, and mortared just like y'all did. Just oh, about. well, maybe not just quite like Quite them, as much, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't go out looking for them. They came looking for us. That yeah, but, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, but so uh, we didn't really like them guys. But, right, this uh, is when you got assigned to, uh, you were in Company A, Mike Platoon. All right, Mike Platoon is a platoon in Company A. We had three maneuver platoons, and uh, it supposedly was supposed to have a mortar platoon, but I never saw one of them. So it Now, was it. Mike Platoon named after you, or is it just happened to be the <laughs> no, M, M no, no, no. Uh, it was actually second platoon, but it was uh, at the time I was there. There was first platoon was Lima platoon, and uh, second platoon was called Mike platoon, and third platoon was called November platoon. So it, hey, it's kind of neat. It makes me uh, uh, feel like it maybe was, but it wasn't. No, it had been Mike platoon, and uh, I don't know if they kept it that way. Well, actually, the whole time that. The first infantry division was in Vietnam because I was there till then. And, now they uh, left early. They left earlier early. than some of those. They left they early. got there early. They got there in '65. They weren't the first uh, major division there. Yeah, I think 173rd was one of the earlier ones. They won the uh, brigade. Yeah, one of the early ones, and the first KO was yeah. uh, maybe a little earlier. But uh, first infantry got there in '65 and uh, left in. Uh, oh, we stood down in February of. Uh, 1970. So I got there about the end of October and got assigned to Company A, 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry, and they were operating out of a rear base of Zion, about 30 miles above Saigon, and then a fire support base, which was there, real rough and ready, you know, go to uh, stay there overnight and go out on missions. Uh, unless you got a chance to go back in two or th every two or three weeks for a few days to the rear where we worked out of. Had uh, barbed wire around the perimeter and uh, and uh, pretty semi-permanent guards there and artillery in there. Yeah, when you said back to the rear, it wasn't exactly a large base camp uh, rear. It was more like a See, fire support base? Or uh, it... Well, no, the uh, fire support base we worked out of uh, daily. Most of the mm -hmm. days was a... a, a Fairly small operation. Uh, yeah. Had bunkers, some bunkers and, and stuff, but uh, it was uh, mainly the battalion was, was all that was there. So uh, three had company A, A, B, C, and D, and then a support company that usually was not there. So there were four rifle companies that was really about all protecting other than the artillery men. Yeah. Let's go through some of these slides, and we're okay. going to go back in. All right, uh, Captain Captain Harvey Kelly was the commanding officer when you got there? Got there, and uh, I actually arrived in Vietnam probably about, the like I say, my time started October the 3rd, and I probably got to the, to the company about uh, the end of October, the last few days of October, and they flew me out to the fire support base, which was called Normandy 3. Uh, Zion was our rear, and that was pretty big. Uh, we didn't get to stay there too much, so didn't get to learn all about it. But uh, flew me out to the fire support base, and, and, and the company commander had a tent. And he uh, said, okay, you're going to be an A company. They need a lieutenant. Their lieutenant's uh, ready to get out of the field. I got a picture later on about the one I took the place of. And he was tickled to death to see me come in because he'd get a job back at Zion. After about six months, this is how they usually try to uh, work it if a lieutenant lasted that long. Yeah. But uh, walked into his tent, and they said, okay, you're going to be Company A. Here's your Company A commander, Captain Harvey Kelly. And he was a fine leader. Fine, that was his second tour over there. He'd been with Mac V as an advisor, uh, his first tour. And uh, I walked in, and um, he was he was uh, military he was firm, but he was, he was a, a charismatic, uh, great leader. But he, right off the bat, he said, okay, Lieutenant, 
I expect you to salute me and, and do it just because we're over here fighting a war. I expect you to be military now. And I just want to tell you that to begin with. I said, yes, sir. Hey. Yeah, I actually want you to salute him? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, listen, sir. That, that's... Uh, in the tent. Oh, in tent. Okay, okay. <laughs> just wanted to make sure we had we had that much. Of course, I salute him everywhere. Every time I catch him out in the field and we had a little action going on, I'd make sure I'd salute, you know, salute him. <laughs> Maybe he'll tell me quit yeah. doing that, yeah. but... Uh, I didn't. I didn't ask my boys to salute me, but uh, yeah, I see. I see he's holding a camera now. Uh, the one of the original brownies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it looks like a little, it. little different than the cameras we had. Yeah. I remember those uh, yeah. over there. That right. picture is is the captain's on the left, and uh, uh, one of the old rifle platoon leaders. He had moved up to be the executive officer, and so moved away from the fire support base and being a rifle platoon leader. Uh, Bill Ember. Ember I see he name. was killed uh, in action 11 20, 69. That was the company commander. What happened to him? Company commander, about three weeks after I got there, we were out on a. And again, let me mention the. Go ahead. The, the, way, we, the way I'm going to describe is feeling one part of the elephant. You know, the blind people feeling one part of the elephant. Mm -hmm. So I may describe something completely different, but uh, if it's a. If it's, uh, a bogus uh, fairy tale that has got spread about the war. I'm gonna tell you about it, like all the kids are trying to kill you and all that bull crap. You know, I just hey, I don't believe all this stuff. Well, it's a little different out where you are in the country. There. Yeah, but uh, you know, that's how a lot of people justified me lying, uh, machine yeah. gunning 500 people. That's well, bull. You can tell bad, the bad leadership there. Yeah, too, you can so. tell the good from the bad. But anyway, yeah. uh, when I first got there, the colonel uh, was had just. Been, not been there too long uh, either. He'd got there about a month for here, and he he was an ex special forces uh, uh, guy officer, and he had uh, this I'm sure his second or third tour, and he was more used to the uh, kind of off the wall type of operating rather than just lining up and busting through the wood uh, jungle, which really didn't work too well over there, and uh, we never operated as a company. So when I first got there and took over the platoon, we would go out. About the first week I was there is all, we, all the time we did it. And then uh, he said, let's quit doing that crap. Just your platoon going through the, uh, like I say, we won't operate as a whole company, so we weren't making quite as much noise, but the platoon was going out search and destroy, I guess they called it. And uh, go out, uh, say, for four or five days and uh, see what we could find, but moving and give them a chance to ambush us, the enemy. So after about a week or two of that, the colonel said, all right, I'm going to, I've got a brand new way of fighting this war. And it wasn't really brand new, it was just, hey, it was a good idea. He said, we're going to go out and the, the enemy... This was late 1969. Tet was over from last year, and the American public was wanting us to get the hell out of Vietnam, and the enemy was knowing about that. And especially in our area, they had broken down into small groups to kind of, hey, keep fighting, but wait, wait, wait the American public out. So uh, he broke us down a lot of times into six-man groups. They'd take us out on the chopper drop us off, find a trail right quick, and sit down and set up your clay mowers. And uh, let me show the clay mower. This is our main weapon right here. This is a real deactivated clay mower in our personnel mine. These stakes here, you stick in the ground, run a wire to the blasting cap, Hook a little hand generator to it. They call a clacker. We'd set up, every man carry three or four of these suckers. We'd go out, the new way of operating, we'd go out and set up and stay uh, a week without moving. Just sit there by a trail. And I, hey, I, was, I had a knack of finding uh, good, good well travel trails. And uh, find one with uh, a lot of thick stuff to your back. And we'd booby trap these things and set them down on, on, on exposed flanks and stuff like that. But when we heard noise coming through, we shoot that charge down that wire that was hooked to this uh, blasting cap, and it would blow 700 steel balls out. 
and each man had set up three or four, and the other guys, as soon as they heard that, they'd start blowing theirs and throwing grenades, and, and all hell would break loose. And, hey, it was about all over in uh, you know, if, five minutes. If you notice, it says front towards the enemy. Uh, there are stories that at night that sometimes the, the enemy would sneak in and turn them around, which would really be messy. We've, we've heard that. We, as a matter of fact, we had, we were set up. Uh, uh, this was in the daytime. We were just staying there for a week in that one spot by a good trail, and we'd already blown one ambush and killed about three. And uh, so, what did you do for food and in the bathroom? Oh, uh, we carried uh, sea rats for uh, a week. You know, we'd go through the big cases and throw away the bad half and just carry the good half. And so we were okay there. I had C4 to heat it up with and hot sauce that our parents had sent us from uh, from America over there to sp- uh, spruce it up and uh, go to a bomb crater and dip some more water. We had five quart bladders we carried water in and uh, two quart bladders. Uh, but usually the five quart bladders were pretty popular over there by then. And uh, we'd dip it right out of the bomb crater or Somme Bay River we were close to and uh, <laughs> Didn't even wait for the uh, purification tablets to take hold. Really, we, you know, when you get thirsty, we just start drinking. And, hey, yeah, I want to ask you a question on that. Okay, uh, I had read somewhere that you're supposed to let the purification tablets, the iodine, the halogen tablets, sit for so many hours. And every time I put money, I went ahead and drank it. I don't know, it, but we, uh, we I, did I, I just got, I just heard that it was supposed mm-hmm. to sit there and and do. But as I poured it mm-hmm. in and put my uh, Kool Aid on top of it and drank away, I didn't. I didn't wait. I always started one if it was having to uh, wait and so forth. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't get none of that Kool Aid. How'd you? Uh, I had my I had my wife send me Kool Aid. <laughs> I was married. Oh okay. Well, I was I wasn't. Yeah. I was single. All I had the uh, the pretty girls over there, and I'll tell you about them later. But that's all I had. Well, there were a lot of very yeah. nice looking young ladies yeah. over there. Yeah, so. <laughs> but I didn't. My mother was sending me uh, uh hot sauce and uh, little chocolate. Uh, Hunts chocolate pudding in in cups, and I share it with the with the guys. And um, but that hey, that worked great. Uh, setting up and being quiet and letting them walk into our. Everybody used trails. You weren't supposed to, but Lord. And we'd find a good well travel trail out in the jungle, and anybody that was out there. It won't. You didn't have to worry about. Are they good or bad? You can't tell the enemy from the. Friendly people, whatever. If they were out there where we were, they were bad, and we were gonna kill them. And so when they come through that kill zone, we blew them uh, claymores in one morning. Oh, we killed about twenty-five in five minutes, and threw a lot of grenades. And they called in helicopters, and uh, and uh, they like for you to jump up and kind of charge, you know, and after you blow an ambush, but that bull. You know, bull. Uh-uh. So I uh, didn't need to do that stuff. Just lay low and just blow the, the hell out of the area and then let the helicopters come in and blow it up more. And it was all over then. Uh, but uh, that one morning that we uh, really had a bunch of them pass through there, we had three little, I broke my platoon nine in three little groups and we waited for them to go all the way through, just like the textbook, you know, but... Uh, it was all part accidental, I'm sure. Well, hey, I'm a brand new lieutenant. I ain't been over there a month, and I'm running into all this stuff. And, uh, and then another, uh, another week or two, my company commander was killed. Uh, this was one of those operations where I think they broke the company down into 12 six-man groups, and they dropped us all in in our position, and you find your position on a trail right quick. And they had made contact with... Uh, Four or five VC when they first uh, sat down that morning of uh, November the twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. Never forget that date. And uh, that's Captain Kelly on the left, and uh, he was uh, aggressive. He, he hey, and I was I wasn't as aggressive as he, but uh, this was a kind of a rough time of the war. It was uh, late in the war. You could see that the American public was against it, and you could see the handwriting on the wall, all the demonstrations and everything. And we did our job. I was a draftee, and I think most of my platoon was draftees. But, hey, man, what a great bunch. 
a lot of them were from East Tennessee, the mountains, and uh, they were just used to this kind of stuff. And uh, just uh, hey, I was I was a leader, but I didn't I didn't require a whole lot of you know saluting and all that stuff. Uh, just do our job, and we all in it together. And at that point, we weren't fighting for America. We were fighting the. We wanted all of our guys to go home, back to their parents' wives or whatever, and killing the enemy increased those chances. I have never lost one minute sleep over that. Uh, it made our chances better, and that's that's what it took. Hey, you didn't win the war. But uh, we did our job, and I have no regrets. So, uh, well, you were in a situation that you either kill them or they kill you. Uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, let's feel good and, and, and so forth. It was mm -hmm. a matter of kill or be killed. Uh, going back to the Claymores a little bit while I go into grenades, uh, folks out there, if you're thinking about it, uh, let's just say it's dark and there's some guys coming down the trail, you want to use the grenades and the uh, uh, Claymores. Uh, first, because the problem with at night is you shoot them, uh, they see the muzzle uh, flash, mm -hmm. and they know where you are just like you know where they are. But with the grenades coming in and the claymores going off, uh, it creates a great deal of confusion, and uh, mm -hmm. you live mm -hmm. a whole lot longer that way with the in last minute to go actually start shooting with that rifle because mm -hmm. uh, that sure tells where you are. It's kind of like using the tracers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, in the jungle, hey, rifle... <laughs> It was kind of a last resort. I mean, you 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 couldn't get a. As a matter of fact, they they taught us in advanced infantry training how to shoot without sights, and I got damn good at it. But you still didn't have enough time. We we shot very few people yeah. at Claymore. Is what we killed them with. And uh, hey, we lay low to the ground, throw the blow the claymores at them, throw the grenades, and 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 shoot a little bit. If you but yeah, shooting even even in the daytime you. you they could pinpoint that a little easier. So, uh, and it did well, not how, jump was, me. How was your leaders there all up into uh, division headquarters? How were they on body count? Oh, everybody was, yeah, that was the thing. That was the thing. Around, around Christmas, uh, like I say, I got there uh, late no, uh, October, and, uh, and, the, and my company commander was killed uh, November the 20th, and I remember the, at the fire support base, Norman the 3, the uh, colonel had a sign up on his had some Christmas lights and stuff decorating his his bunker uh top they call it tactical operations center and uh it it counted down the days like uh ten more killing days till Christmas nine more killing days till Christmas mm -hmm. and I really didn't feel too good about that hey killing killing somebody is a serious thing and uh like I say, I, I, I haven't lost any sleep over it because it, uh, it, it it increased me and my boys' chances of uh, coming back. and uh, But I, I, I didn't kind of like it being a game, you know. But, uh, hey, that was the Army way, and that was the big thing. The, the body count, which didn't work, didn't win the war because we killed a, you know, a bunch of them, you know. And uh, I will say we got support real quick. Now, today... I, I get off subject real quick, but that day uh, that the company commander went in with his small group and they had a little contact and wounded one or two VC, he called in to the colonel and said, I want to go after him. And that was the most dangerous thing you could do. But he was aggressive enough. He had the same idea. And he was there on the ground, and he thought he had a good chance of getting them and killing them and making our guys safer, and so hey, I'm I, I'm I'm comfortable with that. I wish he hadn't have done it there, but because uh, it ran up on, uh, took three or four men out of the group, and ran up on the machine so they basically gun. Basically, ambushed him. Yeah, ran up on the machine gun and uh, wounded uh, uh, about two of the uh, small group and uh, killed him. And uh, I bet when the colonel called me in when we got back to the base, fire support base, and said, listen, we we, we, we haven't been, we, we don't ask you to go chasing after them. That's, that's dangerous. And uh, I, he never told me that. I, I assumed they wanted us to do it, and I just, I was <laughs> not going to do that unless I really had to. But uh, it was at a point in the war 
that uh, charging across openings. If you see two or three VC in the wood line uh, at 100 meters or 200 meters across the clearing in the other wood line, charging across there to get two of them and maybe lose one of your men, no, no, that ain't the way I thought. And that probably ain't the way most, most of them thought. But uh, this was not out on the clearing that he went into. It was in the, in the jungle. And uh, they went after him, and he thought he had a good chance of uh, getting them. And... Uh, they got ambushed, so uh, uh, the company was sad, and uh, he was a good leader, and uh, I, and everybody was kind of, you know, especially probably us officers. We had uh, me and two other platoon leaders, three rifle platoons, and we said, hey, uh, <laughs> this is uh, not good. One of our officer, fellow officers getting killed, and, and I just got there two or three weeks ago. And the other, one of the other rifle platoon leaders, a second lieutenant, uh, got shot in the leg and met a back back out. And the other one got uh, got blown up a little bit with a grenade and got out, and I never got a scratch. So, hey. Kind of give you the idea why they were short second lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, who replaced who replaced? Uh... A, a armored, armored captain, nice fellow, Captain Dorn. Uh, he had he'd been in charge of the artillery back at, I think, back at the uh, fire support base, Normandy 3, that we worked out of. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to have somebody quick, so they made him company commander, although he wasn't infantry. And uh, he was, he was a, uh, a real nice man. And uh, it was hard. Captain Kelly was kind of one of these larger-than-life figures, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it was really hard for anybody to come in re and replace him. And uh, his daughter, this picture coming up right here, and uh, Robin, his daughter, Robin Kelly Rasmussen, still lives in Nebraska, which is where Captain Kelly was from. She's probably watching this now. I sent out emails to, uh, I located about 70 of the old company guys off a roster about 15 years ago, and I sent them out emails from time to time. And she's come to some of our reunions. And this picture... Uh, Dan Kirby had gotten up with her and went with her to the wall in Washington, D.C., and there she's standing right in front of her father's name and holding a picture of her father. And that's General Malloy, the 1st Infantry Division commanding officer, uh, going down the line, uh, giving out medals. They were pretty free with medals over there. He had got them a good body count. They'd start passing out medals. But uh, as Captain Kelly in the picture, the tall tall man, but that's the one uh, the general's right in front of right then, right now in that picture. Do you picture. know about how old Robin was when her father was killed? Uh, four years old comes to mind I'm or sorry. less, not she over four years remember. old. She did so have she, memories. In fact, she a little bit has memories of him, and uh, but there she's holding a, a smaller photograph of him, and that's her hand in the uh, left-hand corner of the picture uh, holding that up. And when I found out about her, uh, Dan Kirby told me that he had found her and gave me some of these pictures. That's me right to the end, of the, in the picture to the right, but standing to the left of Captain Kelly, you can see my shoulder. So I called her up and I said, Robin, you've seen me before. There's my shoulder right <laughs> in your picture you're holding there of your father. And uh, she's come to some of our reunions, just a great gal. And... Uh, just like our daddy. Just got the charisma and the coolness. Hey, that's the main thing. Being an infantry leader in Vietnam has a hundred different ways to charge up a hill if you want yeah. to. I didn't really want to charge up in the hills. But uh, as long as you guys don't, uh, you know, start fussing back. Well, this ain't the right way and all that stuff. And thank God I had a platoon that they didn't give me no flacco or nothing. Even being a brand new second lieutenant over there and screwing up a couple of times. That I'll, I'll tell you about if I, re, I remember. Well, there's a picture of Robin with her husband there at the wall. That's Robin, the same 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 day at the wall. Uh, Robin went to several reunions and even went back to Vietnam. And you, as you probably know, you, she's the uh, reports in the logs gave mm -hmm. the six digit. 
mount location where her father was killed. So she took the coordinates and went? She took the coordinates and hired somebody to take her out there to that very spot. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard about it, I said, my God, how could anybody do that? But she, she, hey, she's that stronger person. And she, I can see now, that was the last place that he left this earth at. And, uh, and she wanted to feel being there. So I think you can get within 100 meters by going to that six-digit coordinate, coordinate. But uh, I, don't, I don't believe I'd have been able to do that uh, myself. But uh, she, was, she was a strong girl. But uh, so it's been great to, to uh, have her in the family now, and I kind of see her as, as the spiritual leader of the of the group because uh, of the later group yeah. that was uh, there towards the end. Now, uh, is that you in the picture on the far left? Far left, the little sky in the picture, and uh, hey, I liked it. I liked being the little sky in the picture, uh, and I could get low to the ground. If you hadn't been, a, I think a little tunnel, you might have been a tunnel rat. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> that crazy. I don't know why they did that. But anyway, we we didn't find many tunnels, and I I never would have sent a man down in the tunnel. I thought that was kind of silly. But uh, that was after that uh, big ambush uh, that happened that we blew after I'd been there a couple of weeks, and uh, we were packing up to come in that morning, and uh, and all of a sudden it just sounded like everybody, all the VC and Vietnam were passing by our positions, and and. The, Waited until it got to the other end, and the guys blew down there in the middle. I was in the middle group, blue, and the first group blew, and uh, we got that flag as a souvenir. Now, that's back probably around the 12th or 13th of November at Normandy 3, behind the bunker behind this formation of Company A. We were uh, waiting on the general to come and uh, pass out a lot of medals since we'd killed so many people a few days uh, ago. And, uh, and you know, hey, they have writers that write up. Uh, I, you know, I could, I've got it somewhere uh, for the medal they gave me uh, the write up. I said, yeah. oh, my God, who did that? I mean, I was, I was just jumping up, just, you know, hey, I won't do that. The colonel flew over. <laughs> I mean, hey, we did a good job, and it won't, it won't be the safest thing in the world being out there with all that going on, but uh, it, it was mainly body count. Yeah. You, you got good body count, they pass out the medals. and uh, That's your platoon there. That's my platoon. And, uh, hey, I love them guys. They were just great bunch of guys. And, uh, what would you say the average age of they are, about 19? I was 26. I'd been I'd gone to every school in North Carolina to uh, board the draft. Yeah, I don't mind telling you. And I tried to get out of infantry, too. All of I'm proud of my CIB, my combat infantry. Well, I joined badge. the Army not to go to Vietnam. <laughs> they didn't work either. <laughs> but that's Mike Platoon. We, they sent us back to the rear base at Zion. Uh, that's probably uh, around the uh, 15th of uh, November for a couple of days stand down. It's hard that, to believe any of us were that young. That's about 22. Two of us, I believe I wrote down it was. Uh, yeah, that's 22 in the picture. We usually had between 20 to 25 going out with us on the operation. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to have 40, I believe, about 40, 45 in a platoon. Yeah, that barracks there was a pretty nice barracks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'd love yeah, to stay yeah. back there. Yeah. But that was the that was the large, fairly large size and safe rear base. Hey, you get back at a place like that. Uh, Lake was the division headquarters base, about 30 miles from there, and it was. Uh, Got some rockets. But hey, rocket ain't no big deal. It's when you're sleeping out there on the ground and hey, you, you uh, get up there where you can see the eyeballs. Of when you're out there like that, on, sleeping on the ground and so forth, uh, uh, did you ever think about the snakes and the spiders and, mm -mm. and that sort of stuff? Mm -mm. Now, the ants would get you sometime. But, oh, uh, yes. Yeah, some biting ants. ants. Yeah. But never saw a snake, never saw a spider. I got bit by a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Not a tarantula, but a scorpion. Scorpion. Yeah. Scorpion bit me in Cambodia, and uh, but didn't see didn't see that kind of stuff. How about leeches? Were leeches bad where you were? Fairly bad. I don't remember getting too many, but uh, yeah, yeah, they were fairly bad. There's George McDaniel. I'm sure he's he's watching. He was uh, he ran some history uh 
museums and stuff like that in later life. And uh, he was actually it was at History Museum up in Raleigh. I didn't know it uh, back before I got back in contact with him. And 83, is that when they dedicated the wall in, in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, I think it Me was. and Ann, my wife, went up to uh, the dedication. And you can see the big red one, yep. and he's wearing one. Now, usually... You like I say, you, we we'd pick up. I wouldn't have been wearing a uniform like this. This has been too bright for me, especially with the lieutenant's bars on there. Uh, I wanted them to wonder who the lieutenant was if they had any snipers out there. But uh, he happens to have one on. So, uh, but he's sitting out there. He's not alone. But he there's some other guys uh, sitting out there. He's eating sea rations right there. Uh, as you can see, he's got he's opening the can. The can the lid yep. becomes a handle. Uh, eating out of it, uh, definitely mm -hmm. not ham and lima beans because he looks like he's enjoying it. No, no. <laughs> and I see he's got his peace symbol on there. He, <laughs> I find out later, he had been, he was, he was kind of a, uh, a flower child, I guess, or a hippie. I, I don't know, but uh, he, he had uh, not been uh, a great supporter of the war back over here, and maybe done some demonstrations in school, and uh, and they, they tried to, they pulled him out of the field. And, uh, hell, he was over there in the infantry platoon, you know, uh, carrying a rifle and killing them just like we were and uh, wanted to investigate him. Now, you're trying to subvert these boys, you know, but against the war and all that crap. If I'd have known about it, I'd have, you know, I don't know what I'd do. Well, I see he, his haircut is not exactly a normal. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a good guy. Yeah. He, he ended up being my radio operator. Mike, let me ask you a question. Yeah. We've had a good time. and got a lot to cover yet. Can you come back in two weeks and finish up? Oh, Lord. The hour's about gone? Uh, you were worried about filling in an hour. We, can, <laughs> we, can, we got enough stuff. We could do another hour. Easy. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, sorry. I didn't mean to talk well, that much. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> that's what you're here for, and uh, we wanted a straight truth and so forth, and uh, enjoyed having you on. So, folks out there, uh, come by, be sure and tune in for uh, part, uh, part two. We've still got about three minutes uh, before we run out of time here and so forth but uh let's go to one more slide if we can and, and then we'll uh and elaborate on that that's right. uh, that's that's, that's the, the memorial, memorial service. service for captain kelly back at zeon uh he got killed on on november the 20th 1969 so that's probably uh uh the end of november we probably in there for thanksgiving depending on when thanksgiving fell anyway so we had a that's the company was having a memorial service and uh he seemed like he was really really uh people really liked him and really appreciated his uh, leadership and 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 like i say he, he, he locked my heels first time i met him and you know he, hey he carried a old german p38 and uh he was there for business and he said we're gonna be military but uh he hey he did it in a way that you'd follow you know he's kind of leader you'd follow anywhere now that's the new uh in the center to the right is uh, the new captain, Dorn, he took over. Is that the guy with his head bowed yeah, there? Yeah, his okay. head's bowed. He's praying that he'll make it uh, make it through. And, uh, but, uh, and now, is that I the am. chaplain in front of him? Is that, that the probably uh, group commander? That I don't, I'm not sure who that was. That's probably the chaplain. Okay. That's probably the chaplain. But uh, Lima Platoon, I see them straight to the kind of to the left and that's Mike Platoon over behind the uh new company commander and uh that was that was a sad day. And uh we uh we and that's a that's an earlier picture of him, I think Robin, his daughter had given him. He was yeah. a uh you know, he could have been in the movies. He yeah. was uh and later on I'll have some pictures, uh, neatest pictures Robin gave me Robin gave me of mm -hmm. in World War Two, him and his brother was dressed up in yeah, it's, we've got the army yeah. uniforms yeah. and uh hey, it was like they they were saluting, you know, they like they were yeah. planning to be in the army. Uh yeah. was his was his uh uh was his father uh military? You know, I'm not sure. Because I was wondering where they got the uniforms from and so forth. They, uh, I've got some in my collection. You yeah. could buy them for your kids. Oh, could you? Okay. And it was a popular war, World War Two. Yeah. As, I, 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 I was kind of young at that, that time. <laughs> uh, if you look at this picture right here, uh, don't get confused like I did. They're not twins. That's it's a motion picture. One, he's got the spoon in his mouth eating his sea rations, and the other one, he's got lit a cigarette. So it's the same guy, two <laughs> mm -hmm. different pictures. 
I kept going now. Twins. I don't know how that got put together uh, like that. He he sent me that. That was the platoon leader, Mike platoon leader that I took over. He was he he was happy to see me come because he got to go back to Zion and get a a better job. But uh, he lives down in Florida, man. Talk to him, and uh, he's probably watching tonight too. Russ yeah. Silver is his well, name. Listen, folks out there, uh, all these guys that Bob, uh, Mike has been talking about. Call in the next week. Our next show is January 24th. Call in and talk to Mike and let him know that you watched the show. Uh, go out and tell all your friends about uh, Mike and uh, his stories and so forth. They're going to get better next next show. Uh, we're going to get into some better stories and so forth. And uh, uh, maybe we can get some of the people to uh, call in that you see the picture here and and they can have a conversation back and forth and talk about it and so forth. Uh, Mike, again, thank you very much for coming in and looking forward to mm-hmm. following up on the next show uh, because I, I want more time to talk about uh, the displays. Mike has want, got travels all over. He's got the best uniform, paraphernalia, memorabilia uh, displays. Uh, in fact, every time he goes by the History Museum, they're on their knees praying to hear die soon because <laughs> they want his display so much. Uh, it is a fantastic display. Uh, he travels all over with it. And uh, if you ever get a chance to uh, uh, see Mike in his display, be sure and do it because uh, it's uh, he spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of love putting this thing together. And uh, it's well worth your time to come to it. I w- mm-hmm. What we may have to do is take the uh, laptop and, and, and do a display and, and use the laptop to uh, make the pictures and, and have just that display on. But, again, mm-hmm. thank you for coming in, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. Mm-hmm. And looking forward to having you back on the 24th of January to uh, hear Part 2. Uh, Lieutenant Mike Cook in the uh, 1st Infantry Division. Excuse me, the Big Red One. Not the first. Okay, Big <laughs> Red One. Uh, who and later he got kicked over to the 25th because mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. the big red ones left him. Uh, thank you very much again and have a good night and uh, stay warm. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.